Uh, today we're in the Axiom uh, Blind Listen Test room, which seemed appropriate since that's the topic of this video. And um, really, in we're probably going to have a series of videos, maybe four or five, on the topic of uh, listening tests and uh, their importance to uh, research, acoustical research, and uh, particularly uh, when it's important that the listen tests are done blind as opposed to uh, sighted. I thought I'd start maybe with just a bit of a history as to how I was introduced to uh, the double blind listen test and it really dates back to the early 80s uh, when I first arrived at uh, the National Research Council and uh, they had a room set up there uh, for the purpose of conducting double blind testing and they've been doing it for quite a few years and, and gathering data on things like uh, do people score sound the same way or does everybody have their own sort of personal taste and it's all over the map and uh, and really I think uh, prior to uh, prior to that research at the NRC most people actually did think that there were there were different different flavors for different people you might say you know if some may remember there was the west coast sound the east coast sound and the british sound and this sort of thing but really, it was determined that that's not how sound works. People are um, overwhelmingly in, uh, in agreement about how things sound and what's better and what's worse. Um, you know, even people who swear they can't tell the difference actually can tell the difference uh, down to some fairly minor detail. And uh, then you have, of course, the, the golden ears, the people who make a career out of, of listening to things. And, uh, you know, they're... They're great people, along with musicians, really, to have in these tests simply because they 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 can detail exactly what it is that uh, they're hearing and 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 write that down, so they can sort of separate uh, in great detail what <clears throat> what aspect they're they're hearing that they liked or didn't like or or absolutely hated. Um, so. Uh, so a little bit of sort of uh, training or experience with instruments and vocals and things like that. It's, it's a big benefit in these double blind tests, and um, it was it was interesting. I always I always like to say uh, you know when I was first introduced to the double blind test. It was an enormous eye opener because prior to that we used to just sort of build a product and then and then listen to it. Never really thought about doing it blind. And and there is there is no question in my mind about the fact that there. There is visual bias, and you cannot get around it. I mean, down to the, down even to the point where, say, we're taking measurements in the anechoic chamber, and then we're going to do uh, listen tests here in this room. If I know which uh, which A or B, uh, which speaker or which um, selection on the switch is which curve, there is absolutely no way that I can't. Uh, sort of say, okay, I'm going to put that aside for now and, and say that it doesn't matter. It, it does matter. And uh, this was also proven in NRC. If you if you took this sort of blind screen away and did exactly the same test, well, then the, the, the results varied enormously depending on, you know, whether people thought, you know, the big one should be better or maybe they recognize the brand or something along those lines. So... The idea of doing a blind test is uh, very, very important if you're going to use it for, for a real scientific research uh, perspective. And um, uh, I'm not really suggesting that anyone would want to listen blind themselves, but um, for the purpose of what we're doing, it, it, it is a very, very important tool. And, and Andrew has a lot of experience with uh, double blind testing as well, uh, dating back, I guess, to the big his uh, beginning in this industry in the mid-90s at Audio Products International. So I'll let Andrew speak a bit to, uh, to your experience with it. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I, I pretty much, the, the entire time that I've worked in this industry, um, I, I was introduced to blind listening tests when I first started working at Audio Products International. And, and of course, when I joined Axiom just about five years ago, um, you know, it was a very familiar aspect of, of what I was used to. And I think it's very important to, to remember and, and to consider that 
Um, we use blind listening tests as a tool. It's, it's a tool as part of the regular day-to-day -day loudspeaker design, in, in really in any design. And the reason for that is that we can't sort of completely correlate all the measurements we can take with, with what it's going to sound like. Over the years, you get an idea of exactly what, me what measurements or what parts of measurements matter and are going to have, an, have a real impact to, to perceived sound quality. But at the end of the day, we can make a bunch of measurements and, and really until you sit down and listen to it and you bring that sort of subjective aspect to, uh, to the design, there's no way to, to tell um, whether or not those measurements actually mean that you've, you've created a better product. Um, when we tend to do blind listening tests here, rarely, and it, it, it's actually fairly infrequent, we'll bring a competitor product in um, to see you know, how we stack up against something similar model, similar price in, in the marketplace. Really, most of the blind listening that goes on here at Axiom is us looking at either a brand new model or um, a new version, series version, um, with our existing lineup. As many of you know that, let's take an M80 for example, that, that product is, is, has existed since 99-2000, uh, since that time period. And it's been steadily improved with different versions. There was the TI, then the V2, V3, and now we're at V4. And the only way that we can gauge is uh, gauge the, the improvements that we're looking to make when we go look towards a new version is by doing a blind listen test. Otherwise, how do we qualify that the new version actually performs better and sounds better than, than the current version? Obviously, that's the only point in making a version change is we've learned something more about trying to correlate the measurements with what we hear and really, the blind listen test is confirmation of that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, especially when you're talking about something like the family of curves, which is, um, is, a, is a, could be a collection of over 300 measurements, depending on the, the speaker. And we develop these algorithms that we use to uh, average these curves out. And, and, you know, our algorithms keep getting better and better with every year that goes by. And this sort of creates a version change. We're up to version four now. Um, but the only way to prove that the algorithm is getting better is to, sub to uh, subject the algorithm to a double-blind test. And... Um, as you can see back here, we've got a couple of pair of speakers. There's a there's a curtain, acoustically transparent curtain that pulls in front of the product, and then you can you uh, can do an A B from the uh, seats over there. Um, in a lot of cases, if we're looking at something just in the family of measurements, we will or the family of curves, we'll just there will only be one speaker uh, on each side, a right and a left behind the screen, and then and then we will change only the, the measurement of that speaker. And that's, that's really actually great because there's something called uh, position error, which if you are doing a situation like this where you've got two actual pairs of speakers, um, you actually have to do the test twice. So you've got to do it in this position and then you have to switch the speakers to the, so they're in their opposite positions, redo the test and then average that data to get rid of the position error. We've, we've tried uh, a couple of times to come up with a switcher that actually physically moved the speaker, and uh, so far we haven't been successful in getting it to do it fast enough because you want, you want almost an instantaneous switch between A and B. It, it's much, much easier for people to be detailed if you do that. So um, we're still working on it. Maybe we'll come up with one that can actually move the position fast enough. For now, we just simply redo the test and then, and then average out the two results. <clears throat> so I think uh, that's probably, probably enough to get started on the subject of uh, blind listening tests. Uh, we're, we'll follow this up with a number of other videos. If there are any questions, comments, whatever, uh, we'll try and include them in... Uh, in future videos, but on a wrap, uh, it's a it's a very very important tool in engineering. I think it's 
important to realize that whatever test you're going to do sighted, you can do blind, and there are good reasons for doing it blind, and also to realize that, you know, it is an engineering tool, and it, it's not necessarily something that people would do at home or even a reviewer would do. I mean, uh, it's, 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 they're complicated and uh, to set up and to, and to do accurately and at the proper levels and everything else, but... Uh, so anyway, it's a little introduction to it. Thanks, Andrew, for joining in, and we'll uh, we'll uh, continue with the next uh, video. Thanks. Thank you.